Okay, I could review the next section of Berserk, or I could record myself doing karate for the next 10 minutes. No? Oh. How? Previously on Berserk, we finished with the battle for Doldry, and I made a error within my video. I'm quite sorry to say I made quite the ruckus about the enemy general being the one who threw guts a sword. Upon re-examining the pages and reading many comments from you all letting me know, hey, this is a mistake people make often, but no, that was not the case, and instead, it was thrown from the demon on the hilltop that we see at the end. So I apologize for being a subpar content creator. I have not only failed you, but I have failed myself. And as punishment for this mistake, in the year 2029, I will be deleting my channel January 9th at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But until then, let's go ahead and review the next chunk of Berserk. Now where we left off, we knew that Guts was thinking about leaving the Band of the Hawk and that this had been an idea he had been batting around his noggin for quite some time. He is motivated by trying to find his own identity and purpose in life. But first, as this chapter is titled, the Band of the Hawk must make their triumphant return. I really enjoy the fact that Berserk like takes the time to have like cinematic scene established shots. It's a detail that not every manga I've read so far does, and I think is done the most cinematically by Kentaro Muro. But here we see there is an assassination plot being developed against Griffith, and it does not only include the people we have seen be a part of this shadowy behind the king's council, but it also includes the queen! That's impossible! because apparently she was having an affair with the man that Guts killed for Griffith. So she's now angry at Griffith and wanting him dead as well. And she even goes on this kind of long monologue about how she really did love this guy. We're definitely seeing Berserk take the biggest step it has into the Game of Thrones and the Song of Ice and Fire type storytelling. I mean, we've gotten political stuff before, but this whole next segment feels like it could be pulled straight from the pages of Song of Ice and Fire. And it's not as polished as you get with some political fantasy. Uh, there is still a dependence from the author on just having characters state things that they should already know just so the viewer can learn it, and it's kind of clunky. But there are some really great highlights to this storytelling as well in the character payoff that we're about to see, so let's keep on going. But as this meeting ends with all the members of the conspiracy signing a blood oath onto an assassination attempt to poison Griffith, we cut to actually seeing the Band of the Hawk return to the city, and they are returning heroes of war. Big time, they just had one of the most important victories, if not the most important victory of this entire war, so the city is going nuts. In fact, we soon learn after this that an armistice has been signed between the nations, and it seems there could even be peace among the land, and this is all due to Guts and Griffith and Casca's actions. They're truly becoming celebrities and being treated as such, and this specific shot of Griffith, it was so like, oh man, he really is a hero of the people, right? And then I see that helmet and I'm reminded of what's to come and what truly lies under the surface for this man. And I am sorry, but Griffith apologists, I am so done with y'all in my comments section. I, I just fundamentally disagree with your assessment of the character, but let us move on. We even see Guts though in this time admiring Griffith's progress and ambition. He still does seem to be under Griffith's spell to some degree. And we also see the princess eagerly awaiting the arrival of Griffith and of course, wanting to be involved with him. She has fallen in love and we also have this conspiracy to kill Griffith uh, re-emphasized with that group of shady characters, but one of the members receives a letter that seems to upset him quite a lot. Cutting to that evening, there is a ball thrown in the Band of the Hawks honor. We see Griffith, Guts, Casca, and the rest of that kind of secondary crew among the Band of the Hawk all coming to an evening where they are seeing Griffith treated as a true celebrity, as well as getting a lot of attention of their own. Though there's politics happening all around. A lot of people are not a fan of the fact that these are lowborns among their rank now, and as the king announces that he is actually planning to raise 
raise Griffith to a noble position, as well as several other members of the Band of the Hawk, there is strong reaction to this news as well. Now, the atmosphere of the actual party itself, you see the people reacting the way you expect they would. Griffith is a natural hit. Guts is kind of just uncomfortable and even makes the line that anyone could see coming from like 10,000 miles away from him that he would be more comfortable on the battlefield. Gah! Like, yeah, okay. I knew that line was gonna be written for him at some point, but there it is. Okay. Casca is being ogled at and chased by a bunch of horny noblemen who are mystified by the, you know, trope of the warrior woman. And she comments on how rare it must be in their life. And, you know, nobles suck. So, all well, that's understandable. We also have through the conversation between Guts and Casca, she pulls him away to escape all of this. Kind of her loyalty to Griffith uh, re emphasized. And the fact that Guts is going to leave no matter what re emphasized. Guts is out and done with the band of the hawk. The king does come out, though, and after announcing his plan to raise all of the members of this successful war party who are in its leadership, we see Griffith is handed a mug that happens to have just been poisoned by a man we see put a little drippily dropily right on in there. But they are being proclaimed the White Phoenix Knight with White Phoenix General. We're seeing that guy who got the upsetting letter earlier, though, is sweating quite heavily as he is apparently nervous about this assassination attempt to kill Griffith. Though, once the poison is delivered, Griffith is knocked out and presumed to be dead. Obviously, the members of the Band of the Hawk are losing their mind, except there's been a look exchanged between Guts and Griffith, letting us know there is something more developing behind the scenes, planned out and known by only them. Guts even makes a comment about him being the one who's allowed to know certain things and how unfair it is to the rest. So yeah, there's definitely already Griffith's counterplay coming in to the countering of what the play of bad people is. But the person who administered the poison has already escaped the room and they are riding out on horseback. And here we see a mysterious figure with a large hat who happens to look a lot like Guts standing in his path and kills him as he is trying to leave off with his, uh, you know, money he got from killing Griffith. We cut to the baddies after Griffith has apparently been hauled away dead, having their own little shadowy council meeting, being like, <laughs> we have killed the lowborn scum. So good. Never will be be humiliated by having one of those lowborn scum administered into our noble ranks. Have I said the thing that we all know that we did enough to re-emphasize that we've done the evil thing yet? Great. But there's a problem. As smoke seems to be coming into the room, they try and escape, but they have been locked in. There's a fiery explosion and it seems they have been betrayed. For the queen looks out the window and sees an alive Griffith down below. Oh my, oh my god. god! I love this dramatic shot we get of like the queen's head in the sky looking down stunned as she sees like five stories below Griffith looking up at her like <laughs> You thought I was dead, you fool. Now you shall burn. I will say it's a little odd to see Griffith talking up at these people burning from such an extreme distance. It kind of makes me think of how much that would not work. Like, look, look at this. What? What? And that's not even nearly as many floors. We then get a long explanation from Griffith on how it wasn't poison who passed his lips. It was just a drug that was gonna make him seem like he was dead and that he has officially declared war on the people who tried to kill him and they are going to be burned. And the queen is like, I won't acknowledge this is happening. This is not happening. Absolutely not. Though I am about to burn to death though. That's unavoidable. I'm gonna die now. Fuck. We get this line from Griffith though that I really like where he says, those who die in the battlefield are not royalty, nobility, or commoners. They are the defeated who die. But we get more shots of the queen and her evil little cohort burning to death and Griffith walking away, not even bothering to watch his plan unfurl because he's that cool. But we get the person who helped him accomplish this and obviously told him what was to come. And it was the little guy who was all nervous during the evil people meetings. Big surprise, Griffith sent him a letter that was like, hey, I have your daughter. Help me or you'll die. And we learned that Griffith knew this guy was going to work to kill him because he knew the guy was afraid of him. And he was like, if you're afraid of something, either you're going to try and get rid of it or you're going to serve it. And you have one option left. Serve me. 
And the guy's like, nope, I'm going to do that because, you know, you have my daughter. And we see Griffith has hired a band of extremely shady looking fellas to take that guy's daughter. And he paid them extra to actually not harass or harm the man's daughter because Griffith isn't that much of a monster, I guess. Although we see once those people take his money, or like, we'd love to work with you again, man. Thanks for the shady business. <laughs> doot, doot, scoop a doop. They go off into the woods and the same man in the mysterious broad hat butcher. It's guts. Like, it's, it's guts working with Griffith. Guts working with Griffith to help him clean up the evidence. We get a reveal where Guts takes off the hat and it's like, oh, nice fashion accessory, Guts. You look like a Dark Souls boss. Not like a boss, but one of those like annoying, supposed to feel like another player. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anyway, moving on. Griffith has some kind of morality though, because as Guts is about to take the money back, he's like, no, no, no. Leave that with them. They have earned it. And I'm like, I guess that's kind of good of you to do, but not really at all. What a hollow, empty gesture, Griffith. <laughs> they earned their money. So let's let that money just wastefully sit there, I guess. Someone else is gonna come along and steal it, I'm sure. But you know, whatever. We also get this really weird moment where like Griffith asks Guts, he's like, do you think I'm a cruel and bad person? And Guts is like, I've murdered over a hundred men at one time on the battlefield. What a dumb thing to ask me. And I am 100% with guts there. What a weird thing to ask. Oh, some people tried to murder you and you counter murdered them just like we do in the battlefield every single day. Why would this have been the line for guts? Don't get that at all. But again, it's like showing Griffith has some kind of internal conflict and moral givings about what he's doing, though I think it's kind of more of a show for himself than anything he's actually feeling because we know the guy is not going to divert from his plan no matter how much blood is spilled at this point. But we see Griffith goes back to the band of the hawk and they are all ecstatic to see him. Oh my lord, he's alive. And he kind of tells them like, oh, don't worry, I was just... I just fainted. It's been terrible. Casca hasn't been herself since you fainted. Just kind of reemphasizing like, oof, she is under his spell. But we cut to several days later when the queen has a solemn funeral and we see that Guts is having some longing, distant thoughts of, yes, it's time for me to go. And he begins heading out. And just coincidentally, Casca seems to be looking out the window at this time and she sees him leaving during the queen's funeral. And she runs on past a few more of the Band of the Hawks and is like, Guts, stop, wait you can't actually be leaving right now. And Guts and her have a long conversation about how he wants to find his own purpose and he wants to be someone who could be seen as Griffith's equal and not just someone who is subservient. And a surface level evaluation of this would be like, oh, Guts is trying to be Griffith. But I think it goes far, far, far beyond that. Maybe even that's what Guts thinks on like his own surface level. But in a much deeper way, this is a part of his larger growth of his character where he used to be someone who was just happy to want wander aimlessly seeking blood due to the level of trauma he's seen. But due to the companionship and the friends around him, which yes, can complete honestly, Griffith did provide in a sick and twisted way, Guts has actually grown and become a literal self-actualized person where he is not satisfied just serving someone else's vision. And yes, in his own interpretation, maybe he's literally trying to make himself more like Griffith, but as a like full psychological evaluation of this character, the reason he's wanting this, the reason he's seeking a beyond is because he has come into his own. Talk about a magnificent moment of character growth. Someone who I used to just think of as a dumb brute as a character, and I don't think I was that far off, has now gone on to the point where they have their own goals and ambitions, personality. He's no longer nearly as shut down as he was, and he has like his own sense of humor. Like there is such nuance and depth available to us as readers through Guts that I could not have even imagined in The Black Swordsman. I love how much Guts has grown. But they do run into two more members of the bands of the hop. They run into Jude and Corcus, and they actually convince Guts to go and have a meal with them before he leaves. And Casca's like, well, Griffith will stop him from leaving. And she splits off on her own to try and go get more members of the party to stop him. But we see Guts during this meal actually ends up kind of getting into it to Corcus because Corcus seems to kind of resent him and be genuinely mad that Guts feels like he has the right to abandon the really good life comparatively to a lot of people in this world around them and just wander off on his own. It's offensive to him. And with his background, we learn of being like a thief and someone who was put down by Griffith and then welcomed in this life. He feels so lucky and loyal. It gives us again a look into how much Griffith has control over his followers and also an angle of like, yeah, there is to a person who maybe doesn't have as much clarity of the world around them as Guts does, a big injustice being done by one, leaving members of your party, but also leaving the comfort of a life that many would see as a privilege in such a brutal world. And yeah, I personally, if I was in this world, I 
would not follow Guts's call here. If I didn't have a clear vision of Griffith, I didn't see the layers of things going on, it would be easy to just sit back and slide into that more comfortable life of being in such a successful band like the Band of the Hawk. But we see Guts kind of take a more direct, maybe showing some of that anger that's been building under the surface towards Griffith as well, because he says he cannot stand seeing Griffith look down on him. And for my read of this, this is due to a couple of reasons. He does still put Griffith very high up in how he views him. He respects and admires the crap out of Griffith. And so, yeah, seeing someone he really wants to be his friend, someone he wants to be like the person he's the closest with him anyways, look down on him and have stated so, so directly to the princess, that's going to drive someone who's as driven as Guts insane. But I think it's also because Guts is having a little bit of a extra sense here that's telling him there is a lot of danger around Griffith and it's manifesting itself in some ways that Guts hasn't fully realized yet, but he's getting some inklings of what's going on. But after Corcus leaves due to his anger towards Guts, he's left with just Jude. And she provides, again, a lot of depth to her character that I've actually been looking for. This is a character I've wanted to get a better look at because she's kind of been floating around that outside. And we finally get it and we get another angle of why someone would fall in with Griffith because Jude's never really been the best at anything, but following Griffith, who seemed like the best at so much, just seemed like a wonderful usage of her many talents. He's someone who provides opportunity through his level of competence, and that's a real thing in the real world, and how people end up following some batshit people because they're like, well, I'm really good, and I'm able to do what I'm good at through them. But this is also a beat clearly being taken to better establish the people who are going to be, I think, still brought around Griffith and the actual demons we first saw. But all right, let's get into that later. Jude actually is more driven here, and she's specifically talking with Guts about his romance with Casca. And it's kind of just stating pretty straightforward all the things that we, the readers, have been, you know, figuring out through all the little beats that Guts has had with Casca. Obviously, Casca is obsessed with Griffith. There is a lot of strong feelings and attraction between Guts and Casca though, and it's obviously a better match in the long run, and we, with our perspective as readers, know that, but with the complex dynamic that's going on between the three of them, Guts is partially leaving and wanting to find this self-actualization so that he could view himself as someone who's good enough for Casca. Personally, I think if he just laid all of his cards on the table at this moment and told Casca how he feels, she might actually, after some time, eventually be talked into leaving with Guts and forging a life on their own, but obviously Guts is not that aware of the situation, not that confident in himself, and doesn't want to do something something he would view as one hurting Casca and putting her in a bad position and a direct action against Griffith, who he's not trying to make an enemy. But alas, Casca will never be with Griffith because Griffith is going after that princess who can provide him the thing as it stated within the text here that Casca never could. And so we have just two people who should be together. But unfortunately, no matter how much we scream at the pages, they aren't going to do so. And I doubt the world is dark as Berserk is ever going to allow these characters a peaceful, nice time together. I am dreading where this is going to go in terms of my love and feelings for these characters. I'm bracing to be hurt by this story. I can feel it coming over the horizon. Oh, God. But they crest a hill, and it seems that Casca has gathered basically the leadership, as we've come to know it, of the Band of the Hawk, including Griffith, to try and stop Guts's leaving. And there's a lot of emotional dialogue back and forth, and people do try to convince him. We even have Corcus once again kind of screaming at Guts, saying, like, I actually never liked you on the battlefield. I was tempted to hurt you. And because you're not going to be a member of this group anymore, if you see me again, watch your back. And of course, me as someone who knows Guts and Corcus is like, um, that's adorable. It's like watching an angry toddler try and like flex at a gorilla at the zoo. That, that would not go well for you, child, if that glass was not there. The metaphor in this situation, the glass is Guts is not wanting to kill you, but if that was God, it would tear you to fucking pieces. But after all this emotion, we get one final beat between Casca and Guts, but then we see Griffith has drawn his sword. And finally, the sheer level of insanity and lunacy of Griffith is put on full display for his soldiers to see, and they have a pretty harsh reaction to it, as you would think, though it does fall into the culture of the band, so it makes sense that, like, oh, they would be okay with the fact that Griffith is going to actually come at guts here, but we as readers know it's not because of the culture. Griffith is doing this because, as he states here in the text, I thought I told you then that you belong to me. This isn't about the culture of, like, mercenary bands. They're above that now. They've been knighted and all this crap. This is about Griffith thinking Guts has no right to leave him because he 
owns him. He says, I won you with this, meaning his sword. This is not someone who's right in any conceivable way. He's not even motivated by the justification put forward by the other characters in the text to justify it for themselves. This is emotional for Griffith. But Guts doesn't back down, and we even get this shot showing that these two are going to go at it. As I said, the band has their reactions to this. They can't believe it. Casca has had to be held back, but this fight is going to happen. And they all kind of acknowledge in their own internal dialogue, Guts has gotten so much better. He is a match for Griffith now. And we as the reader have seen that as well developed. There's nothing too supernatural about Griffith yet, so Guts has just reached peak human where Griffith seemed to be in a different way, where they've definitely done different stats, but they're both top level and they're about to go at it. And talk about foreshadowing. I don't know what's going to happen to Casca, but this frame knows me it's going to be bad and I am not prepared. We see the internal dialogue between both fighters and they are clearly aware of how dangerous this is going to be for both of them. Though the attack does happen and in the first swipe, the first move, Guts puts Griffith down. He disarms him and gets him to the place where if he wanted to, he could kill him. Absolutely establishing that at this point, Guts is stronger than Griffith. And my own personal theorizing is that means Griffith is now as his most dangerous ever. He has been put down. And if there is one thing we know about Griffith is that he does not like to be put down in any way. This is someone who views himself as earning his own kingdom, someone who should absolutely be on top always. And, um, his supposed second or third, depending on how he actually views it. I don't know that well how he ranks his people. He just got bested. That's not gonna go well. Maybe I'm wrong. I haven't read Berserk. I'm just trying to fill in from what I've seen in the foreshadowing, what I'm able to predict because of, you know, story beats and typical story narratives. But uh, I think Griffith is about to go full Norman Bates, not, not to go open a motel in the middle of nowhere, but more like he's gonna just go crazy. We see this has just emotionally destroyed Casca. She is so upset seeing that Guts is leaving. It's not about who won the fight. It's more just there is very much so two sides to Casca. We as the reader have seen there is a side of her that is definitely wanting a life outside the band, wanting something more, wants something else, but there is still her obsession with Griffith and she looks between the two and she makes her decision and stays with Griffith. And that is why I think if Guts had pushed her, she would have gone because she was almost there. But this is shocking for many members of the band to see who even see Corcus going, damn it, I won't accept this and it's a fluke. It had to be because, oh my God, how could Griffith, the guy whose dream they're all walking in, be bested? And he could be bested though because Guts is just, you know, motherfucking Guts. But that is where we are going to end this review. There is a piece of art of the Behelet that kind of ends all of this. And holy crap, does that seem like an intentional choice that is going to scare me. And we also get this image of Griffith wrapped up in darkness. And yeah, this is someone who is already near going full off the edge. And I'm seeing a lot of signs here that we're about to see him go, uh, well, let's just say belly flopping in the deep end. I think this was outstanding though. Despite some of the more clunky nature of how exactly Griffith got what he wanted at the beginning in that very political first half, the emotion and character beats in the second half elevated this so, so high for me. This section of Berserk, I am giving an 8.5 out of 10 and I am drooling to see what happens next. I have rarely been so emotionally enamored by a story and my own caring for the characters and I'm only on delight volume three and I'm not even done with it. We have so much more to go. I can't imagine how much is left for these characters because this feels like the end of an epic and yet we're really just getting started it seems structurally so how much is left for guts? I have no idea. I am just absolutely in love with Berserk. So like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. If you'd like to hear me talk about some more non-fantasy things, go ahead and check out my second channel, The Discussion, where we just released our video on Star Wars. I'm on Twitch, I got books, I got merch, and have a good one, y'all. Bye!